So how much do you know about the biggest global health problems affecting our world? Most of us are familiar with the plight of HIV, TB, malaria. Some of you might even give money towards these causes. But there's a big global health problem that doesn't really receive the recognition that it deserves, and that's anemia, caused by a lack of iron in the diet. And more than two billion people on this planet are anemic, largely women of reproductive age and their children. Anemia has serious consequences for human health and socioeconomic development. If a woman is anemic during pregnancy, she's at increased risk of hemorrhage during childbirth. Her children have increased susceptibility to infection. They have deficits in mental and physical development, and it leads to decreased energy capacity in adults. In fact, hundreds of billions of dollars are lost every single year as a direct result of anemia in in the workplace. The standard treatment for anemia is iron supplements, either in the form of pills or powders that usually need to be taken every single day, and they're not without their consequences. There's many side effects, and people tend not to like taking iron supplements. And as a result, compliance is typically quite low. In addition, they're often quite expensive and far out of reach for hundreds of millions of people that need them the most. And so, I've devoted my adult life to trying to change that, to trying to make treatment as accessible as possible around the world. After finishing my undergraduate degree in health science in Canada, I took a bold step, and I moved to Cambodia. I packed my dorm room up into a suitcase, and I traveled 14,000 kilometers to the hot, dusty, and crowded streets of Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia. I quickly moved to a remote rural village. There were about 800 people that lived in my village, and almost all of them subsisted on rice farming or fishing in the lakes and rivers that dotted the landscape. I moved into a typical Cambodian hut, much like the one shown here. It was raised off the ground about 10 feet, with a simple slatted bamboo floor and walls, and a tin roof that roared when the rain fell. I was the only foreigner to live in in my village. I was the only English speaker, the only one with an education past grade nine, and I was the only health professional that had ever stepped foot in the area. My job at the time was to scream for anemia and treat parasitic infections as I came across them. Every day after working in the villages, I used to come home and I'd quickly bathe in the river, eat a simple Cambodian meal of fish and rice, and then escape as quickly as possible to the confines of my bug net. The mosquitoes in Cambodia were truly atrocious, and I'm, I come from Canada. I mean, I know bugs, but there was no way to describe it. So I, I typically spent 7 p.m. until 7 a.m. beneath that bug net. I brought an iPod with me to Cambodia. And this is back in the day. They didn't last very long, and I only had about 30 minutes each and every night, no more and no less, to listen to some music and get a little bit of an escape from reality. And I even lined up the song so that I could avoid skipping the track and using that extra little bit of battery life. So I usually made it until Sunday, and then at that point, I would travel to a neighboring town where I could charge my batteries, eat a more substantial meal, and shower for the first time that week. All that time spent underneath the bug net did, however, have some positive aspects to it. Namely, I was able to think, and I thought a lot. And despite my best efforts, my thoughts always traveled back to the reality that I was living in, to the different health problems that existed in the village that I was working in, and to what could possibly be done about them. So, as I mentioned, my goal at the time was to look at how common, how prevalent anemia is in those communities. And so, I purchased a, a centrifuge, 1980s era. From a hospital auction, and I hooked it up to a car battery. I then took blood samples from the neighboring villagers, and I was able to quantify the problem. The best national estimate suggests that a little over 50% of women and children in Cambodia would be anemic, but I was actually finding rates closer to 90%. So as the summer wound down, I, I, I knew that I couldn't just un uncover the enormity of this problem and then walk away. I had. Scheduled to be in Cambodia for about three months, and then I was supposed to go back to Canada to start a master's in neuroscience. And I took a bold move about a week before I was supposed to leave. I called up my supervisor back home, and I said I wasn't quite ready to leave just yet. As I say, I couldn't uncover this enormous problem, write a report that no one was going to read, and then walk away. I had to keep working. And to my surprise, my advisor was actually. Uh, very supportive of the project, and actually encouraged me to ditch those rat-based experiments in the lab that I had no interest in doing, anyways. I mean, we both knew it, 
and to stay in Cambodia and to try to find a solution. When I moved to Cambodia, I had no idea how dire the situation would actually be. Everywhere I went, people were laying in every inch of shade that they could find. No one had any energy. No energy to work, no energy to play, no energy to, to learn. And iron is essential in the development of the human brain and body. And what I found was that the children who were raised anemic had no ability to sit in school and concentrate. The other hidden consequences of anemia were a little bit harder to appreciate at first, but I did uncover them over time. In the village that I was living in, scores of women had suffered significant hemorrhage during childbirth directly as a result of anemia. A handful of people in the neighboring area had even died. In science, we often learn that the simplest answer is the best, but it, that concept is, tends to get forgotten in, in real life. And so I charged myself and those around me with finding a solution to the problem, a simple solution, one that would be cost effective, one that would be environmentally sustainable, and, then, and one that would be accessible to even the most remote rural villagers. And so I began poring over medical journals, and eventually I had a breakthrough one day. I discovered a series of experiments that looked at the use of iron cooking pots as a way to treat anemia. The concept is really quite simple. If you cook food in an iron cooking pot, some of the iron leaches from the food and fortifies each and every meal. So in theory, we had a really great treatment option here, but in practice, it didn't quite work out. Iron pots are expensive. They're heavy. People don't really like to use them. And on top of that, in the developing world where people don't have access to drawers of Tupperware, people who cook food typically leave it in the cooking pot overnight until it's eaten. If you leave food in an iron cooking pot, it spoils. And so I thought there must be a way to add iron to the cooking pot, and then the iron could then be removed. The iron needed to be added to any type of cooking pot, whether it be the aluminum ones like they use in Cambodia, whether it be clay or steel. It had to be cheap, it had to be effective at releasing iron, and it had to be environmentally sustainable. And so, the lucky iron fish was born. And here it is. We started off with a few different uh, prototypes in the early months. It didn't always end up as this iron fish. First, we started off with an iron bar, a plain iron bar. And it did tick all the boxes. It was cheap and it was effective. It did release lots of iron. Except there were huge problems with it. Everywhere I went, different families had found some use for it, just not in the cooking pots. People were using it as a doorstop, as a paperweight, even to prop up a table with a broken leg. I mean, I saw everything. So then I moved on to a disc, something that was a little bit more attractive, um, maybe ease some concerns that the iron bar might harm people's cooking pots, but it still didn't really make sense. So, next idea, how about a lotus flower? Lotus flowers are something that are common, commonly seen all over Cambodia. They're associated with different Buddhist scriptures and with spirituality, and so it sort of made more sense in the cultural context. Of course, it didn't make any sense at all when it comes to cooking. You wouldn't put a flower in a cooking pot. It's the next idea. Finally, fish sprang to mind. Cambodia is a country that relies entirely on fish. The mighty Mekong River that dominates the countryside provides a livelihood and food source for millions of people. Fish is typically eaten at almost every meal, certainly every day, and the underlying flavor to almost all Cambodian dishes is a type of fish paste called prahok. So it's essentially made by taking sardines and grinding them up, heavily salting it, and then laying it in the sun for days to weeks on end in order to ferment and, dis and acquire this distinctive flavor. I'm sure you can imagine it's a, an acquired taste. And so I knew that fish made more sense. And interestingly, fish in Cambodia also are associated with luck. And I finally had something. So I tried a few different iterations of the fish design. The first was too big, the second was too bulky. The third, well, it was a little bit ugly, and so we had to keep reeling and changing the design over and over. And eventually we landed on this particular species of fish that's called tricantrop in local dialect. We slapped a cartoon-like smile on the fish, and we had an instant success. Understanding the human link here was key to solving this problem. Scientists often work in silos, and we tend to forget why we're doing what we're doing and how it impacts people's lives. 
And we needed to have a detailed understanding of nutrition, of anthropology, of public health, and of medicine, all within the Cambodian context, to solve this problem. We had to embrace the complexity of the problem. So the iron fish are made using locally available scrap iron, essentially old car parts. By using these scrap materials, we're confident that we're able to produce a product that's environmentally sustainable. We produce these locally in Cambodia, and by doing so, we also contribute to a fledgling economic development of the country. We could have farmed this out to different companies throughout Asia that maybe had a little bit more experience, but it didn't make sense. It didn't contribute anything to Cambodia if we did that. Now, ascorbic acid, or vitamin C as it's more commonly known, is a well-known enhancer of iron absorption. You see, our bodies are actually miraculous in their ability to regulate how much iron is taken in and how much is expelled. This is how you're able to eat a huge steak meal and not go into iron toxicity. And we know that ascorbic acid, or vitamin C, enhances the absorption of iron. It helps to process it and makes it more readily available in the gut. And so what we do is recommend that people take the lucky iron fish and they use it when they're preparing their boiled drinking water, to which we suggest they add a small amount of citrus juice, just as if you're having a slice of lemon in your water. Alternatively, you could use the iron fish when you're preparing soup. And now soup is something that's typically eaten in Cambodia on a daily basis, and to our advantage, is also commonly soured with some type of vitamin C, whether it be citrus juice, tamarind, or even tomatoes. We suggest that people use the iron fish for at least 10 minutes every single day. So to make sure that the iron fish actually worked, we had to subject them to a battery of tests. First, we needed to make sure that they didn't contain any heavy metal contaminants. After we were confident that we weren't going to do more harm than good, we needed to see how much iron was actually going to be released from the iron fish. And so I took a batch of them back to my research lab in Canada, and I prepared several different varieties of soup and water, and then I subjected that to metal analysis to see how much iron was actually being released. And the results were absolutely astounding. We calculated that by consuming just one liter of boiled drinking water or soup every day, a person could meet just 75% of their iron requirements. And that's not taking into account any of the iron that might be in the food to begin with. So theoretically, we had an effective solution, but we still had to test to see whether people would accept it. Discoveries are made all the time that promise to save the developing world. In, in practice, they're, they're, they usually fail. They're usually too technically complex too expensive, or for one reason or another, people just don't accept it. And so we tested that out. We distributed iron fish, about 400 of them, to five different test communities. And we asked women to use them every single day when they were preparing their boiled water or their soup. We took blood samples on day one, and then three months, every three months thereafter, in order to see how the body was responding to the iron that it was being presented. Now, I'll tell you, Taking this blood was actually an exercise in patience and dedication. Cambodia is a relatively hot country. I'm sure you're all familiar with what that feels like. And we had to keep the blood as cool as possible. So we had to travel around with big coolers of ice. We also had to make sure that we could get it to the lab for processing as soon as humanly possible. And so every day after traveling by boat or by road across these different villages taking blood samples, I had to then get on the back of a dirt bike with the blood strapped to my back, and drive into the capital city and drop it off the lab for processing. And I did the same thing every single day. But the hard work did actually pay off. And in the end, I'm pleased to say that we ended up with a two-fold reduction in the prevalence of anemia. And better still, we had an over 90% compliance. In the public health world, we're really lucky if we can get people, to, about 50% of people, to take up an idea. The fact that we had 90% of our, of our villagers using the iron fish each and every day blew us away. The anecdotal evidence was perhaps even more interesting. Everywhere I went, I had scores of people come up to me and tell me how the iron fish had helped their families. They talked about how they had more energy, how they didn't get headaches the same way anymore, they didn't feel dizzy, the women suggested that the children were growing up healthier, happier, stronger. It was as if I was reading a medical textbook and checking off each and every symptom of anemia. The fish truly were a success. 
Today, the iron fish are being produced at a mass scale, and we've just added a small little element to the design. We now have a, a small tracking number so that we can ensure that they're made of high quality, and we can keep track of when the different batches were made. The Lucky Iron Fish Project is now registered as a social venture in Cambodia, and we actually employ a team of Cambodian representatives who travel across villages, spreading word about the Lucky Iron Fish, talking about nutrition, about anemia, and about all these different health consequences that can result. The iron fish are purchased nominally by those who can afford them, and they're given to those who can't. Other treatments for anemia just aren't accessible to these remote rural villagers. You can rack up hundreds of dollars in hospital bills, and quite often the hospital technicians aren't really that skilled at dealing with what they're presented. Iron supplements, as I mentioned before, have side effects, but in addition, they're also quite costly. And we end up with people who, um, who, who really can't afford to support themselves. Just to give you the context, a one-year supply of iron pills for one person would cost about $30 for the entire year. By keeping production local and using readily available scrap materials, we're able to produce the iron fish for just $5. So a one-time investment provides enough iron for the entire family for upwards of 10 years. The key to success, as I mentioned, is hiring locals. We, we take people that live in the communities, they have the trust of their fellow villagers, and they know firsthand what it's like to be anemic. We provide training on behavior change and marketing, and we still to this day work with the Royal University in Phnom Penh and the University of Guelph in Canada together in a partnership to make sure that we're producing fish of high quality. We, we definitely don't want those heavy metal contaminants. We're starting small, but we're a determined bunch. We're currently just in one province in Cambodia, but we're scaling up massively. And by the end of this year, we expect to be over several different provinces. You can have the best public health intervention in the world, but if people don't use it, don't accept it, then you really don't have anything. And simple innovations save lives. With the Lucky Iron Fish, we really are saving lives and improving life. Thank you.